uh, Ojuku SAM. Also, after him, I welcome the University Bosa Al Aj Abdulafiz Omani. And the Baba that controls the whole reading habit of this university, our father Al Aj Izaka Alao. May I request on the arrival of the guest lecturer that will have our seat, and I invite the Chief Imam of Faculty of Law in our midst, Mr. I.O. Salahuddin, to please step forward for the opening prayer. Mr. I.O. Salahuddin, let me quickly invite Mr. Saliu Ataragwa to please step forward and lead us in the opening prayer. I have the honor to invite to join the high table my Lord Honorable Justice S.D. Kau to please come to the high table, sir. And my Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Akashoro, will agree with me that we have in our midst two eminent personalities that must not be in the to floor me. today if the Faculty of Law is the Faculty of Law. I have the honor also to invite to join the high table one of the leading pioneer dean of the faculty, Professor Abdul Hakim Ijaya. You see, to many of you law students, you were not fortunate, many of you here present, when Professor Hakim Ijaya was the first. Dean, after Professor Abikan, we have Professor Abdul Hakim Ijaya with us. I also have the honor I have the honor also to invite to the high table another powerful SAN, our own Oga on top. Always smiling. Oga, Oga Jombai Shia, as it's fondly called. Sir, you are most welcome. Let me also invite to the high table the father of law and the teacher of teachers in the faculty of law, Professor S. A. Belo, to please come to the high table. When you mention Baba Belo, you mention company law. And I will not want to be giving a query immediately. Let me invite the powerful woman behind the success of all you are seeing today, the incumbent dean of the faculty, Dr. Mrs. Bayero Jima. May I declare to us, DVC, sir, if you permit me, If I'm permitted, I will let you people know, with the permission of the management, that the dean is henceforth referred to as the Iron Lady of Alikima University. I have just cited also, my dean, you have a new cap today as the Iron Lady of the faculty. I cited, I was actually deceived by that unusual cap when I cited the cap of the immediate past dean of the faculty who has laid down this soft landing for the incumbent dean to achieve all this. It's no any other person, ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome to the high table professor A.T. Shehu to come with his usual style.
Let me also quickly welcome to our midst our father, Professor Okunlola. I said it before you arrive here, that I will meet you in the auditorium. You and Professor Bode, you are always punctual to the programs. Thank you very much, sir. You're most welcome, sir. Let's now commit this program to the hands of Allah by inviting Mr. S.A. Ataragba to please lead us in the opening prayer. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الملك الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صلوا على النبي الكريم Thank you very much shall we say amen to that prayer that is our own Mr Ataraba of faculty of law and we call him the scribe of the faculty thank you very much for that opening prayer Sorry, please, let me quickly invite to join the high table is an omission, please. Please pardon that. The Vice President of the Institute of Shattered of Mediators and Conciliators in Nigeria, Dr. Adiola Adams, all the way from Ibadan to grace this occasion. Thank you very much. Shall we rise now for the national anthem? If you call
Now, may I invite the chief imam of the Muslim law students of Alikma University, Abdul Malik Maidoga, to please come and give us a short and serious Quran. I don't know why you are so excited. But I want to guess there are some things going on on the ground. Abdul Malik, though a four or level law student, but has the old Quran off hand. You're most welcome. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما Surak Allahul Azim. Shall we say that Allah Akbar once again? Like I said earlier, Faculty of Law, Alikma University, is a very notable faculty in the whole Nigeria. We have no equal in terms of what Allah has actually blessed us with. Shall we say Allah Akbar once again? Let me say that we have many of them in the faculty that have memorized the old Quran and are doing very fine in the study of law. Now, while the Quranic recitation was going on, our father and teacher and mentor just joined us, the father of Islamic law in the old Africa. It's no any other person than Professor Abdul Qadir Zobai. Sir, you're most welcome, sir. And I would like to quickly also recognize the presence of the state coordinator of National Human Rights Commission with us. And I beg your pardon for that oversight, Mrs. Jumoke Okoye Esquire. 
you're most welcome. I'm going to have the list of other dignitaries joining us. Oh, I've cited another dignitaries and partners. Please help me lead her to the front seat. She's part of Alikima. She's even Alikima. Dr. Mrs. Mrs. Biola Adimola, you're most welcome. She's a friend and part and parcel of Alikima University, time in memoria. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation. Now, I would like to quickly go over the introduction of the guests here present with us. We are with us today the Deputy Vice Chairman of this, uh, Vice Chancellor of this great university, Professor G.O. Akashoro. You're most welcome, sir. <laughs> Who is with us in a dual capacity is representing the Vice Chancellor and equally is representing the Office of the DPC. He has a dual role to play here today. Sir, we are honored by your presence, sir. Thank you very much. Let me also quickly welcome and recognize the university bossa who has just taken his exit, Al Aj Abulafis Omani. And the university librarian, Al Aj Isiaka Alao. Sir, you're welcome, sir. I would like also to start by introducing our guests and dignitaries from the guest lecturer of today. It's no any other person than Chief himself, Chief Anthony SAN. You're most welcome, sir. <laughs> Chief Ojuku is known all over the world, all over the faculties of law, of law in Nigeria. By the time we listen to his citation now, you know that I don't need to say much about him. He's already res ipsa locutor. Sir, you are most welcome to Elone. And I'm sure this will be your first time of entering this university. Aha, I guess right. And you are here to give the maiden first lecture of Faculty of Law. We are highly honored, sir. And I also want to welcome our father, Justice Retired But Not Tired. Honorable Justice S.D. Kawu, retired Justice of Kora State High Court. <laughs> Sir, you are most welcome. I can now pick where Professor H.E. Shewu picked the idea of that cap. I can see the same cap with Professor H.E. Shewu on Justice S.D. Kawu. <laughs> Let me also welcome a powerful SAN who on every occasion we have in this faculty will always grace the occasion with us. It's not any other person than our own Oga John Bayesia. Sir, you are welcome. <laughs> I also like to welcome in our midst the Dean of Law. When I say the Dean of Law today, there are Dean of Laws. And there are also Dean of Laws. The Dean of Law, the second Dean of Law of Alikima University, and the incumbent Dean of Law of University of Ilorin, my own teacher, Professor Abdul Hakim Ijaya. <laughs> Next to him is another Dean, the Iron Lady of Faculty of Law, Alikima University. Is no any other person than the Dean of Law, Faculty of Law, Alikma University, Ilorin, Dr. Mrs. Bayero Jima. Thank you. Honestly, our appearance today sends different signals. I almost believe that the Dean is going for another wedding, the way I saw the gorgeous dressing. Thank you, my Dean. Let me also welcome and recognize the immediate past dean of this noble and dynamic faculty, Professor A.T. Shewu.
Thank you. And also, I have the honor, most singular, to introduce the teacher of teacher, the Baba of Babas, our own father, the man that is very synonymous to company law. He has worked tirelessly over many universities, many companies, and still not tired, Professor S. A. Bello. I also like to welcome to our miss the Vice President of the Institute of Shattered Mediators and Conciliators of Nigeria, the person of Dr. Adiola Adams, who, inshallah, by the time we get to the program, is going to present a few things to us in this program. Thank you very much. And other dignitaries ex of departments of Alikima Universities and lecturers of Alikima Universities here present. Sorry, I have with us also the Dean of Postgraduate Studies, Professor A.O.Y. Raji. <laughs> sir, you, you should please move to the floor, sir. By the power conferred on this microphone, sir, that you should move to the front seat, sir. You know, this, this mic is very powerful. <laughs> You can see that I'm trespassing now. I move a whole thing, a whole thing to the front seat with this mic. By the time I drop the mic, I believe I will not be fired. <laughs> and also, we have in our midst Professor Okunlola. Sir, you're most welcome, sir. Oh, Baba is the incumbent dean of natural sciences of the faculty of Alikima University. That means we have the assemblage of deans in that front zone. And I've equally introduced my own father also, Professor Bodel Awa, the dean of earth sciences. You're welcome, sir. Let me once again introduce my own father the man that taught me what Islamic law is. I've said it earlier, in Africa is next to none. Professor Abdul Qadir Zobai. Baba, you are welcome. And once again, I want to reintroduce the presence of the State Coordinator of National Human Rights Commission, Mrs. Jumoke Okeye. You're most welcome. And our own Dr. Biola Adimula, worldwide. You are welcome. The Director of Academic Planning of Alikima University just joining us, Dr. Sikulai Nuruddin. You are also welcome. Without wasting our further time, let me quickly hand over this microphone to the Deputy Vice Chancellor for the thesis opening remark. Thank you very much, sir. Professor G. O. Akashoro. A round of applause for the DFC. It's not easy to come all the way from Korea. It's in North Korea. Audubilai Mino Shaitan Rajim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. We thank Almighty Allah, the owner of everything and the creator of all things, for making it possible for us to witness today an event, a trailblazing event in the history of uh, the Faculty of Law. We thank him immensely for sparing our life to witness today. On behalf of the founder of Alikma University, Chief Abdurrahim Amao Oladimeji, UFR, Dagumulu, and Ashwajo of Igumina Land, Baba of our kingdom, and the entire membership of the Universities 
Board of Trustees, Council, Management, Senate, and students and staff of Alikma University. Welcome you all, and particularly on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, to this occasion. A groundbreaking occasion as far as the Faculty of Law is concerned. This is the first in the series of public lectures from the Faculty of Law we are going to be expecting. I like to appreciate of our guest lecturer of today, Barista Ujuku, who we believe is going to have to inspire in us an impactful lecture bordering on violence, especially of the child. Violence has been all dimensions which we are going to be told. The child being tortured, the most manifest of this violence is the one that is physical. But the, the child suffers other perspectives of violence, emotional, mental, and spiritual violence. It is an evil that permeates all society and which all of us must fight against. I like to also appreciate other dignitaries that are present today that have graced this occasion for us. We appreciate them, especially members of the bench and bar, and particularly our retired justice. We appreciate the provision of law as the provision that is renowned to be noble, a noble profession. We appreciate all those who put their sweats into organizing this event, starting from the indefatigable Dean of Law, who has been running up and down with his team to make today successful by the grace of Almighty Allah. We appreciate you and your team. We also appreciate the immediate past dean of Faculty of Law for providing leadership and guidance towards successful organization of this event. We also appreciate all other deans of other faculties that have graced this occasion. We appreciate your commitment and camaraderie in identifying with the Faculty of Law on this auspicious occasion. The students, we appreciate you. Your presence here today. This is your day, and you must get the best out of the knowledge you are going to gain from this lecture. On behalf, again, of the stakeholders of the university, and on behalf especially of the Vice Chancellor, I welcome you all to this public lecture, which I believe is going to be very impactful in reshaping our orientation towards the pervading evil in the society that we should guide against. We should not be tormentors of the child. Everybody passes through childhood, and we know how defenseless the child is. 
whether male or female. I thank you all for making it today for the Faculty of Law and for the university and its entire management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Alikima University, Professor Abdulgeni Olalika Akashoro. Now, I have the representative of the founder of this great university, Professor Jamil Suleiman, able representing the founder of this university in this occasion. Baba, you are most welcome. And right next to him, I can see my hoga, who handed over this microphone to me. Professor L.F. Oladimeji. Prof, you are most welcome, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Now, you have come at the very right time when we are about listening. When we are about listening to the dean of faculty of law, the iron lady herself. But before that is done, Baba will not be here in our midst today without being in the eye table. Let me most, with every humility and simplicity, invite the representative of the founder, Professor Muhammad Jamil Suleiman, to take his seat on the high table. There have been many tight schedules for the founder, but alhamdulillah, today he has sent to us our father, Professor Jamil Suleiman, all the way from Kora State University. Baba, you are most welcome. When Baba is taking a seat on the high table, let me now invite the acting dean of the Faculty of Law. Dr. Mrs. Bayero Jima to please take the podium and give his welcome address. Hauzu billahi mina shaitan rajim Bismillahi rahman rahim All thanks and praises is due to Almighty Allah for making today possible We plan as human beings but the supreme is the best of planner. For allowing us to realize today, I think all the dues are given to him. We appreciate his mercies on us and will continue to praise him. I'm overwhelmed with joy today. To see my fathers, my uncles, aunties, mothers, and lovely students present to listen to today's public lecture. The founder of Alikima University who is unavoidably absent in person of Alaji Chief Dr. Abdurrahim Oladimeji, OFR, FNAEAP, FSPSP, Ashiwaju and Jagumolu of Igbomino Land, Arogundade of Lagos, Baba Oba of Ofa. 
I'm President General of Arohif, who is ably represented by Professor Jamil Suleiman Jima. You are welcome, sir. The chief host, who happens to be the main planner of these events, but who is not around to grace this occasion. He was the one that met with the guest lecturer at a function. He liars with him. He gave me his phone number to always contact him. When, it was, when the date was changed by the guest lecturer, we initially planned 6th of June, but it wasn't convenient for the guest lecturer, so the vice chancellor agreed to 13th. But the day we picked 13th, he told me, Mariam, I won't be around for that program. Yesterday, when he called, he insisted that the, the program should be here online. As we are here today, people are looking at us all over the world. The chief host, in person of Professor Noah Yusuf, FSPSP, heavily represented by the DVC, Professor Akashoro, our amiable DVC, you are welcome to the occasion. The guest of honor, retired Honorable Justice Suleiman Durosilong Kau, as my uncle is fondly called Durosilong, we pray that Allah will continue to enrich him in knowledge. Allah will give him peace. Allah will give him rest of mind. Allah will grant him all his wishes. And may he miss the mercy of Allah whenever it is time for him to depart this earth. My uncle, the retired CJ of Quara State, you are welcome to this occasion. The chairman of the occasion, in person of Malam Yusuf Olaunu Ali, promised me yesterday that he will send a representative. We are still expecting the person. The, person, the chairman, who is equally unavoidably absent, is welcome to the occasion. My father, as I fondly call him, in person of Barrister John Olushola Baesha, SAN, who promised us to be here despite his tight schedule, is humbly welcome to this gathering. We pray Allah continue to bless him. He's such an humble man. I again welcome my Oga, my supervisor, the gentleman to the call, in person of Professor Akim Ijaya, to this occasion. I'm indeed sorry for not after introducing my DVC, mentioning my bossa, who has made fonts available for this occasion. <laughs> it's such a big omission. We are so sorry. <laughs> My bossa in person of Mr. Omoni Yafis. You are welcome. And our Baba, the librarian, who has been fatherly to the faculty of law, is always particular about equipping our library. A round of applause for him. In person of Alaji Alao, Isiaka 
he, he, he corrected me in one pronunciation of his name. <laughs> Unfortunately, I forgot again. You are welcome, sir. <laughs> I will mention the guest lecturer last because <laughs> he's the man we have all come to listen to. So he's, 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 go, he's going to be referred to as Egunla Tinkoyigbale. Maybe he doesn't understand that, but we have to translate it to him. <laughs> that he's a masquerade who, are, who, who we are going to call last in this occasion. Mayoga in person of Dr. Mrs. Biola Adimula. My beautiful Oga, you are welcome to the occasion. My prof, Professor A. Zubal, the father of the faculty, you are welcome. My prof, who I quickly reminded yesterday of this program, in person of Professor Kanike, Professor Abiodun Kanike, SAN, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Kwasu. You are welcome. My supportive Dean, the Dean of Natural Sciences. He has been here earlier than expected, in person of Professor Okulola. You are welcome. The chairman of the stakeholder of Alikima University, you are welcome to this occasion. And our father, the dean of health sciences, the most healthy dean in the whole Alikima University. He's so healthy, despite his age, is always attending functions and meetings. You are welcome, Professor. Going back, yes, Dab. Dab, why are you sitting at the back? <laughs> Dab has been so supportive. That is the director of academic planning unit in person of Dr. Nuruddin. You are welcome to this occasion. Dr. Hadam, who is going to be discussing on mediation and conciliation, you are welcome to this occasion. Yes. The Dean of Dean and the Dean of Humanity, they are the, the best of Deans is the Dean of Dean of uh, Postgraduate School in person of Professor A.O.Y. Raji. You are welcome to this occasion. The Dean of Humanity in person of Professor L.F. Oladimeji. You are welcome to this occasion. He doubled as one of the pe person representing the founder in this occasion too. Himself and Professor Jimo were to represent the founder. You are welcome, sir. Mrs. Jumoke Okoye from, from Human Rights Commission. You are welcome. And all your entourage, including my PhD colleague, you are welcome to this occasion. The representative of schools. I could see them seated here. You are all welcome to this occasion. I will be rebuked if I do not mention my personal persons. That is the faculty of law lecturers who have been so supportive and who have made this occasion a success all the lecturers, I want you to stand up for recognition and please put uh, your hands together for them. They are good, 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 they are good. They have been too supportive, they are good. Allow we continue 
to strengthen the faculty. My fathers, in person of Professor S. A. Bello, he is the chairman of today's occasion. In respect of holding the committee together that organized the program, you are welcome, sir. And another father, Professor A. T. Shewu, who has tremendously been supportive for this program. You are welcome to this occasion. Our distinguished guest lecturer, in person of Chief Tony Ojuku, OFR, SAN, FICMC, the Executive Secretary of Human Rights Commission, please let's put our hands together for him. He has made us proud. He has made us proud. He tight scheduled. He made sure that he boarded yesterday. He landed in Elorin Airport. We picked him at 6 o'clock and we logged him. Around 9.30 today, he called me. Are you not picking me for the lecture? He has been wonderful. All other dignitaries present. And my students, who I will forever be supporting to, who I will forever be their lecturer, you are welcome. My student told me this morning that, Dean, we are having company law tomorrow. We will not be able to come for the function. I said, you must come. <laughs> The two hours of this lecture will not make you to fail your company law. And I promise you, all of you will excel. You are all sincerely welcome to this maiden public lecture of the Faculty of Law, Alikima University. The Faculty of Law, Alikima University choice of discussing Child's Rights Act enactment by the federal government, its domestication and implementation by the state in Nigeria, 20 years after, was influenced by the fact that not much has been achieved in this regard. Many children are still suffering from the same fate has existed prior to the advocacy for the enactment and domestication of the law. Unfortunately, the states under which child rights act, under which child rights laws falls, that is residual list, do not have mechanism for the detection of abuse and the children are left to suffer. Most abuse results from the ignorance of the parents of the existence of the law due to poor publicity and translation of the laws into native languages. The financial predicament of parents is also a factor that impedes the implementation of the child's rights laws in states because the children are forced to fetch for their needs. The absence of accurate data of the population of children that falls within the protection of the law is equally a huge tax. This lecture is timely and luckily to be discussed by an erudite scholar who was part of the enactment implementation committee and who had succeeded in identifying challenges by child rights laws in the state and reviewed the journey so far on the enactment and implementation of the child rights law. And has suggested ways forward to having an impactful implementation of the law. It may also interest you that the Faculty of Law, Alikima University, in collaboration with the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliator, that is ICMC, incidentally, in which the guest lecturer is a fellow of that institute, also deem it necessary to quickly seize this opportunity 
to introduce to students and the general public the special mediation skills, accreditation and certification training, which will be discussed briefly and which we take off from the Faculty of Law at Likima University. We employ each and every one of you present here, both students and guests, to please make an application to the faculty to be part of the lectures, so that in Nigeria today, we need many people that will be educated, that we have knowledge of mediation and reconciliation. We should reduce the extent of our litigation. So we employ you to please subscribe for the course. Once again, on behalf of the entire Faculty of Law at Likima University, we sincerely appreciate your coming and wish you journey messages to your various destinations. You are welcome to the occasion. Can we appreciate the Dean better than that? It is not easy to be the iron lady of your faculty and means of reputable professors. Uh, notwithstanding the recognition given by the Dean of the faculty, I would still like to recognize the dignitaries that have just joined this occasion. Let me first and foremost recognize the chairman stakeholder forum of this university. When I say stakeholders, the major budgets of this great university, the man that has been working around the clock to support this university, Alhaji Ori Sankoko. You are most welcome, sir. I also have the honor also to, to recognize and welcome to this occasion our own teacher and father, Professor Amoda Koneke, SAN. You welcome, sir. The representative of the Malam Ola Oluali, SAN, who has actually been designated today to be the chairman of this maiden occasion, is heavily represented today by Barrister Nuruddin Adeboega. Please come to the front seat, please. Dr. Elo, please help me give the front seat to. Please, to the front seat. That is where Mala Mala Ali will be. Let me also recognize and welcome representative of Nigerian Bar Association, MBA Ilone Branch that are here also today, this morning, to grace this occasion. You are all welcome. We cannot waste any time, given the topic at hand, that we are expecting justice to be done. We are examining the child's rights today, the child's rights. And that is why we have some of the students in our midst to listen to what the law has to say in terms of their protection. They are the voiceless in the society. And that is why the national executive himself of National Human Rights Commission, Chief Antony Ojuku, SAN, has been invited to come and do justice to this topic. With due respect and honor, I most humbly want to invite the guest lecturer to rise as I invite the lecturer designated to read out the citation of the guest lecturer, Mrs. Mutiat Lakadri. So please join me in the podium and give the citation of our guest lecturer, the company law lecturer. The citation will be given while Chief Ojuku remains standing. Sorry for keeping you standing, sir. My name is Mutiat Abdusalam Lakadri, and I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at Likma University. I have the singular honor to read the profile of our guest lecturer. Chief Anthony Okechuku Ojuku, OFR, SAN, FICMC. 
was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1986, having graduated from the University of Nigeria. Having graduated from the University of Nigeria Enugu Campus as a lawyer in 1985. He was appointed the Executive Secretary of the National Human Rights Commission for the first term in April 2018. He was again reappointed for the second term in the office in April 2023. Prior to his appointment, Chief Ojuku S.A. Hen has had a distinguished career with the commission spanning over two decades. During this period, he has held senior positions and was at various times the director in charge of monitoring, protection, and investigation, legal services, protection and monitoring, and the office of the executive secretary, where he also served as a special assistant to the, to the Executive Secretary of the Commission. Before his long sojourn at the National Human Rights Commission, which he joined in 2001, he had started his career in public service from the Federal Ministry of Justice, Marina Lagos, in 1987. as the research assistant to the then Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, the late Prince Bola Ajibola S.A.N. He later joined the National Electoral Commission in 1989 under Professor Humphrey Unwosu, where he rose to the rank of Assistant Director of Legal Services in 1993. He participated actively in the conduct of the June 12, 1993 presidential election and was, and was subsequently appointed as the administrative secretary of the defunct National Electoral Commission from November 1993 to June 1996. He joined private legal practice from 1996 to 2001 and advocated for the rights of the poor, the sick, the less privileged as a human rights defender. <laughs> Chief Ojuku Hesse Hen has made sterling contributions to the strengthening of the rule of law, human rights, and democracy in Nigeria as well as spearheading key electoral and justice sector reforms. He led the institutional and legal reforms which metamorphosed into the historic amendment of the Commission's enabling legislation in 2010, making it independent class A human rights institution. No wonder in the same year, 2010, he was appointed the Special Assistant to the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Prince Adesto Kumbo Kayode, S.A.N. During his tenure, he has deepened the Commission's protection mandate and served as the chairman of the following special investigation panels. The sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria, Pre presidential panel on special anti-robbery squad of the Nigerian police force, special investigation panel on military shites in Kaduna State. He has also served in response to allegations of mass human rights violations established special independent investigations on 
the Nigerian Police Force in the year 2020 and the Nigerian Armed Forces in the year 2023. Working with the Governing Council of the Human Rights Commission, Chief Ojuku's administration has recorded accomplishments in policy and institutional reforms in staff welfare and productivity, establishment of offices of the Commission in the 36 states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, enhanced complaints and investigation mechanisms, increased funding and partnership portfolios from public and external sources, leading to the expansion of the programmatic, programmatic mandates of the Commission. A key commitment of a second term in office will be the implementation of the recently approved National Action Plan for the promotion and protection of human rights in Nigeria between 2023 and 2028. Recently, it was added to his mandate several uh, accomplishments in the designation of the Commission as a national preventive mechanism for the prevention of tenor under the optional protocol to the Convention Against Tenor against torture. Chief Ojuku has authored and edited well over 16 publications on human rights <laughs> and international law, and has, and has many articles in international journals, and delivered more than 200 papers at conferences and seminars at the United Nations, the African Union, the International Bar Association, the Nigerian Bar Association, <laughs> and other local and international conferences and seminars. On the 31st of May, 2023, Chief Ojuku celebrated his 60th birthday on the eve. On the heels of his assumption of second term in office, he is the first staff of the Human Rights Commission who has risen, who has risen to become the Executive Secretary of the Commission. He is the first serving Executive Secretary of the Commission to be conferred with the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in 2021. He is also the first executive secretary to be conferred with the national honor of Officer of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, OFR, in 2022. In the same year, he was awarded a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Mediators and Conciliators. Chief Ojuku, Officer of the Order of the Federal Republic, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators, is married to Lady Hobi Ojuku. And they are blessed with children. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our guest lecturer, Chief Ojuku SAM. Thank you very much. This is um, very exciting to be here. I must, first of all, pay my profound respects 
to the founder of Al Hikman University, Aladi, Chief Abdurrahman, Olad Miji, OFR, FNAEAP, FSPSP, Dasiwaju, and Jagumolu of Ibomina land, the Arogun Dade of Lagos, the Baba Oba of Ofa Kingdom, the President General of Aroif, home and abroad, and also the founder of our Hikman University, who made it possible for us to be here today. Thank you very much, sir. I must thank my friend, Professor Noah Yusuf, the Vice Chancellor, who we met, that was in early February or late January, and he told me, you need to come to our place and do this lecture. And I promised him that I will make it possible to be here because when it comes to something concerning children, that is where we should make our biggest investment. So I want to thank him for his thoughtfulness to make this happen. And of course, in that meeting was also the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Akashoro, who was there with us. I recognize you, I want to thank you for this opportunity and with us also was uh, the Bossa, Afi Somoni, he was there, and the librarian, Alaji Isiaka Lao. Thank you for this opportunity. I must pay due respects to my Lord, the former CJ, Justice Kau, and also the Dean of Law of the University of Eloran, who is here, Professor Akim Ijaya. My own learned brother, Silk, John Bayelsia, and my own brother, Professor Eti Shehu, the former Dean of, of Law of Ikman University. I, I started this discussion with him, and I'm happy it's materializing today. I must also pay due respects to Professor S. A. Bello, the former Dean of the Faculty of Law of, of the University, and Dr. Adaola Adams, the Vice President of the Institute of Chartered Bishadors and conciliators, who is my, my fellow member who is here today. There are so many deans, and these are wonderful deans in all their respects. Please, in order not to make any mistake, because in the academic institution, when I was in university, the dean was like, we, 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 we didn't have to see the vice chancellor really, you know, our, our life revolved around the dean. So <laughs> the dean was your own, your own god in the university, you know, because you can, you can be in the university for, for two, three years, four years. You may not even see the vice chancellor. But your dean, when he's passing along the corridor, <laughs> you better behave well. So let me, <laughs> let me pay due respect to all our illustrious deans that are making uh, academics work in both this institution and all over the country. You have my due respect, please. And the, I think the Nigerian Bar Association is here. Please, I, I pay my due regards to you. And um, the law lecturers, thank you very much for gracing this occasion. And 
of course, I have my constituency here, the, the National Human Rights Commission in Ilori. I'm happy you are here to, to get this occasion. And then the people for whom we are here today, the students themselves. I think you deserve all the kudos because if not for you, we would not be here today. So please give yourselves a round of applause. The topic for which we are here today is very, very important. I am happy this is an academic environment. You know, you know what an academic environment does? It helps you to revolutionize your mind. It helps you to think out of the box. You know, you can read law, for instance, and you, when you graduate, you now work in administration. You don't go to court. You know, you can read sociology, for instance. When you graduate, you go and work in the bank. Do you know that? Now, what the academic environment does is to, is to revolutionize your mind to, to think, to question things, and to find answers. So what we are going to do here today is to challenge some of those basic ideas or notions we have, either culturally, socially, religiously, and so on and so forth, so that we can start thinking out of the box in order to improve the future. And that calls the question of the need for an overview of the implementation of the Child Rights Act, which was passed by the National Assembly in 2003. Principally, there is something we call the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was passed by the UN in 1989. Convention on the Rights of the Child is an international instrument that makes sure that children are put at the center of human rights. Before then, there was no special instrument to protect the rights of children. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child asked all the nations of the world who are members of the UN to put in place in their local environments laws for the protection of the rights of children. You always hear that the children are the future. We were once children. I, 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 I was just listening to when it was said that I graduated in night, I was called to bar in 1986 and I graduated in 1985. Everywhere I was like, oh, this one must be a grandfather. <laughs> I'm sure in 1986 and 1985, most of our students here were not even born. <laughs> so, you will also grow one day to become like us. Do you understand? So it is therefore very important that all the opportunities that you need to succeed in life are given to you. Do you understand why it is very, very important to have a law that protects the right of children? And no nation, no nation can succeed without investing in its children. Do you understand? Very soon, most of us will, will pass away. And you people will become the senior advocates, you people will become the deans. You people will become the vice chancellors. Do you know that? And the preparation for you to play that role is now. If we don't prepare you to play that role now, 
the VC tomorrow is not going to happen. The senior advocate tomorrow is not going to happen. The deputy vice chancellor tomorrow is not going to happen. So we need to invest in you now so that you can play the role you ought to play in future. So the need for a child rights act cannot be overemphasized in any country in the world. It, Nigeria is not an exception. Under the laws of Nigeria, for any international instrument to become applicable in Nigeria, the National Assembly, like you have the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was a convention passed by the United Nations, for it to apply in Nigeria, the National Assembly of Nigeria has to pass it as a local law so that it becomes applicable in Nigeria. You know, in the Constitution of Nigeria, you have different classes of items that can be legislated by the federal government, the state government, the local government, and so on and so forth. The issue of children is one of the issues that the state government and the federal government can legislate on. So if the National Assembly passes a law on child rights, it may not automatically apply in the states. So every state has the power to make its own law on child rights that will apply in the state. So when the Child Rights Act was passed in 2003, incidentally, I was the project officer for the passage of that act in the National Human Rights Commission. When we worked with stakeholders, with UNICEF, with MBA, with civil society groups campaigning all over the country for the passage of the Child Rights Act by the National Assembly, which was eventually done in, 2020, in 2003. So every state now was expected because the Child Rights Act was like a domestication of the Convention on the Rights of the Child but because it was passed by the National Assembly, it cannot apply automatically in the states. The states have the power to apply, the, to, to make their own child rights law. However, the intention was that the child rights law of the state should be as similar as possible to the Child Rights Act at the center. The Child Rights Act has been passed in 2003 in Abuja, but the various states have to pass their own state laws. And as much as possible, that state law is supposed to be very, very close to the provisions of the Child Rights Act. You know the, you know the reason why? Every child is the same. Do you agree with me? Are we together? A child in Lagos is the same as a child in Meduguri. Is the same as a child in, in a Cross River. Is the same as a child in a lorry. Let me give you an example. A child born in these four different places will need the mother to breastfeed the child to grow. If the mother is not well nourished, it will affect the child. The child needs milk. The child needs all the basic ingredients so that that child will develop well. Is that not correct? Now, if a child is growing, 
the child will be taught by the parents how to wash their hands, how to eat food, how to bath, how to wear their dress, how to wash their dress, okay? The same child. Is there any child who should not be taught how to eat food? Is there any child who should not be taught how to wash his or her dress? Is there any child who should be naked while other children are wearing clothes? Also, the law, the Child Rights Act, expects that every child, for instance, should be given the right to survive. What does that mean? Every child should be given the right to, to live. If a child is born and there is supposed to be some vaccination, there is supposed to be some inoculation so that the child will survive, that child cannot help itself. The mother will take the child to the clinic for vaccination. The father will provide food to make sure there's food in the house. Every child is entitled to education. Can you imagine those of us who are here today? Can you imagine if we didn't have the opportunity to go to school? Are there not some of your friends, some of your age mates who are not in school? Are there some? Are there some of your friends, for instance, who stopped in primary six? They didn't go to the university. I have some of my schoolmates, some of my classmates. We did primary one to six together. They couldn't go to the secondary school. I have classmates who went to secondary school with me. They couldn't go to the university. Some of them, when I go to the village now, they are Panwine Tapas. You know what a Panwine Tapa is? Do you know that? Some of them, when I go to the village now, I need to support them. But because I went to school, look at me here today, coming to talk to you about Child Rights Act. Can those my classmates who are Panwine Tapas in the village, can they be invited to come to talk to you here about Child Rights Act? They cannot. So look at the opportunity that, has, that I have Look at the world of opportunity. Today, because I went to school, I trained as a lawyer, I'm able to become a senior advocate. I'm able to become the executive secretary of Human Rights Commission. If I didn't go to school, will I be able to do that? So it is very important that every child should have opportunity to go to school. Also, you know, in most of our families, when decisions are being taken, they don't consult you children. Is that not correct? They just tell you, this is what we want you to do. Okay? I used to cite one example about the importance of consulting and discussing with children in things concerning them. Whenever I travel overseas, I'll be bothering, ah, what will I buy for my daughter? Will I buy uh, shoes for her? Will I buy a hat for her? Will I buy a skirt for her? Will I buy a trouser for her? You know, I'll be bothering myself. I'll go to the shop. Maybe what I wanted to buy for her is $500. Then I just said, okay, let me even call my daughter to find out what she wants. So I called my daughter. And I, I said, daddy, 
I want a scarf. And when I checked the price of the scarf, it was ten dollars. Are we together? Now, if I felt that I know what she wants, I just buy it. I will spend five hundred dollars. But I have now discussed with her, and she told me what she really wants is costing me ten dollars. Have you seen the difference? So the child rights act says it is always good to allow children participate in what concerns them. We shouldn't be thinking that we know what you want more than you. We know we are supposed to guide our children as parents. But there's nothing wrong in discussing with you just like you now going back to the campus, there are a list of things which your parents are supposed to provide for you. And your, your parents may be sweating, hey God, how will I get the money to buy? Maybe they said you should bring uh, uh, four, four pairs of shoes. But you know that one is enough for you. And if your mommy or your daddy discusses that list with you, you say, mommy, don't worry now, one is okay, let me use one. You don't know the pressure you have relieved for your parents. Because their salary is fixed. So the Child Rights Act says, in doing anything concerning children, it is very useful to allow them to participate. So now, like I was saying before, all children are the same. No matter where they are born, no matter where they are, whether they are in America or in Europe, or in Nigeria, every child needs education. Every child needs to survive. Every child will need to participate in discussing issues concerning him or her. So we expect that the child rights provisions in the 36 states of Nigeria should be similar as much as possible. We know there will be some basic differences, but as much as possible, they should be similar. Because, like I said, there are basic principles of non-discrimination. You shouldn't discriminate against any child. At the center of everything concerning a child is the best interest of the child. What does the child really want? Like I showed you now, I may think that my daughter needs something that is $500, but when I discuss with her, what she really wants is something of $10. So we expect that the child rights law in all the 36 states should be similar in these basic respects. Where a child should be able to go to school, a child should be able to participate in things concerning him or her, a child should have the, to, the right to survival, be given an opportunity to live so that all the potentials in that child can come out in the future. However, it appears that the Child Rights Act of 2023 is not being reflected across the 36 states. 
the states have modified some provisions according to cultural beliefs and indigenous ways of life that are peculiar to their jurisdictions. For instance, there is the thorny issue of who is a child. What is the age of marriage of a child? Like I said, a simple analogy is this. A child needs some time to grow from age one to age five, okay? By age six, a child is supposed to start school. Is that not correct? In school now, how many years do you do primary school? You do six years. So at the 12, a child should be entering secondary school. How many years do you do in secondary school now? Six years. So at the age of 18, a child should be finishing secondary school and entering university. Is there anybody here now in the university that is less than 18 years? Maybe you get 17, some very smart ones 16. But is there anybody who is 15 years? I doubt it. But there may be some who are 16 or 17, but majority will be 18 and above. Is that not correct? Now, when you now define the age of a child in such a way that it doesn't allow a child to complete secondary school, secondary school is 18 years, ideally. I know some of us enter secondary school by 10 or 11. But ideally, by 18, can you imagine the world of difference it will make in your life as a girl, as a boy? If you don't have secondary school education, I told you of some of my classmates who are pan white tapas and farmers in the village. We started school together. If you compare them to those of us who continue school today, the difference is so much. So the essence of the Child Rights Act is to provide an enabling environment so that the full potentials of children can be tapped. And if those full potentials of children are tapped, they'll be more useful to the country. They'll be more useful to themselves. They'll live quality life. Look at all these ladies here now. All of them are graduates. Wouldn't you like to be like, like them? See how well looked after they are. Look at all the men who are here. All these men here have all gone to school. They have benefited from education. So if we prepare a child in such a way that the child will not benefit from education, automatically we have said that this child cannot go beyond this level in life. Yes, there may be one or two or three that will struggle on their own, maybe go into business, get money and train themselves in school. There are cases like that. There are cases like that, people who did not go through formal education. You know, their parents paying their school fees. They grew up and trained themselves. In fact, they, they, they took exams from home. They took GCE from home. But if you have 1,000 people and only 10 survive like that, that kind of system is not reliable. 
So it is very, very important that the child rights laws that we are passing in all the states are in such a way that children are provided the right to education. So it raises the question as to whether these modifications uphold the original intention and the general principles of child rights because despite the domestication of the Child Rights Act in 2003, in many states, the prevalence of child marriage and the practice of our marriage still persists. In addition, there is the Supreme Council for Sharia in Nigeria, as well as some legislators from the northern part of Nigeria, who have characterized Child Rights Act as anti-culture, anti-tradition, and anti-religion. And this signals the great religious and cultural hurdles that still need to be crossed to fully achieve uniformity of the practice while child rights is concerned. I make sense to say that child rights is not about religion. Child rights has nothing to do with religion. Because a child is a child, no matter the religion of the child. A child needs to have education in order to realize his full potentials. So most of the challenges we have are more of cultural. They are more of cultural. I remember in particular when we were doing advocacy for the passage of the Child Rights Act. And this issue of the age of marriage became a very big issue. You know what we did? We went and got some Muslim scholars. We, 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 we went and co-opted Mrs. Mariam Ways, who was the wife of the Chief Justice of Nigeria then. We went and co-opted Justice Adamu Algi, who is a Justice of the Supreme Court now to help us to do some research to find out whether this issue of child marriage is Islamic or whether it is cultural. And we came to the conclusion that Professor Mohammed, even though the daughter was betrothed before the age of 18, but the marriage was not consummated until she went to school and got to the age of 18. I don't know whether there are, there are some other Muslim scholars here. This is what they told us. This is what Mrs. Mariam Ways and Justice Amina Algi told us. So, for instance, you see in some communities, girls are married off at the age of 13, at the age of 12. That is not Islamic. It's more of a culture because, for instance, in Kwara State here, I don't see girls being married before 18 years. It will not be a common practice. In Lagos, I don't see girls being married before 18 years. In Oshu, I don't see girls being married before 18 years. And still, these are Muslim families as well. However, when you get to Sokoto, or when you get to Zamfara, you see girls being married at 12 and 10. Is it not the same religion? Do you get what the point I'm making? So it's more of a cultural practice. It's not a religious injunction. However, those of us in common law practice we are told that our cultures, our cultures should be in such a way that they should be in line with natural justice, equity, and good conscience. For instance, there's a culture in my place that before you become a man, you have to go and do some rituals 
they take you out in the night, you know, go and do some juju and all those kind of things. <laughs> but is that true? <laughs> I'm a man now. Nobody did that to me. <laughs> I'm a man with wife and children. <laughs> I didn't go through that because by my own time, people had said, no, this kind of culture that says you have to go and do some rituals and go to some secret gods and they will, they will, they will give you marks and uh, you take some, you know, there are some clay, clay. That you put. So, you know, that is, that, that kind of culture, you can, it cannot uh, exist now. For instance, a culture that comes maybe before you make a new Igwe in our place, they say you have to, uh, or if an Igwe dies, you have to bury him with some human beings. Can that kind of culture be sustained now? Who is going to bring out his own child now to be buried with the Igwe? You know? So that kind of culture is no longer. We have found out that those things are myths. There is something we call the Osuka system in Igbo land. Have you, you, may, you, may have, you must have heard about it. When I became executive secretary, I mounted a very serious campaign on AIT for almost one year, you know, challenging the Osuka system. The Osuka system is a system where they believe some people are used as sacrifice to the gods in the olden days, before my grandfather was born. Now, because they were serving in the shrine, they are not regarded as equal to other human beings. And these people, they are always very fine and beautiful. Very intelligent, very prosperous and wealthy in our communities. Still, they will tell you, if you are an Osu, you cannot become an Igwe, you cannot become a chief, you cannot marry from them. It was so bad in the olden days that in the market, you can't sell things. To, if they come to market like every other person, you cannot sell things to them. If you sell things to them, you'll be ostracized. Should we be continuing with that kind of <laughs> custom and tradition now? The answer is no, because those are myths which have no... Um, uh, no relevance in, in current realities in life. So, when we have cultures that does not make us progress, we need to look at those cultures again. So, the central question that this article seeks to find answers to is, why is there a low pace of implementation of the child rights law in the states across the country. This article argues, it argues that slow pace of implementation of a child rights law in Nigeria is a result of cultural and religious barriers that accommodate practices that are contrary and inconsistent with the provisions of the Child Rights Act. It further poses that children are the most vulnerable and marginalized persons in the country, and the government of Nigeria, as well as the respective state governments, are duty bearers and are to be held to account for the slow implementation of both the Child Rights Act and the Child Rights Laws. These governments are failing in their role to discourage such practices that demonstrate cultural and religious impunity against the child. By signing and ratifying and enacting child rights protection laws, the different tiers of government in Nigeria have taken upon themselves the obligation to put their best foot forward and lead in harmonizing the laws of the country in such a way that they are in the best interest of the child. This article submits that Nigeria, however, has not done its best in this regard. 
So based on the foregoing, this article undertakes a comparative analysis between the provisions of the Child Rights Act and that of the respective child rights laws by exploring their differences while focusing on the key cultural and religious challenges faced in the implementation of the child rights laws. The discourse will highlight the prospects of good implementation by both the federal and state child rights laws for the betterment of the child in Nigeria. Let us look at the adoption and ratification of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. For the first time in international law, children were viewed as right holders, as opposed to objects of adult charity. Through the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989, the CRC became the most formidable document on child rights with the greatest number of ratifications. The Convention is notable because it was the first binding treaty to combine the integral social, economic, and cultural rights with civil and political rights in a single legal instrument with equal emphasis placed on all the rights provided in its preamble and 54 articles. Nigeria signed the CRC on 26 January 1990 and ratified it on 19th April 1991. Thus, Nigeria made a commitment to promote and protect the rights of all children within its borders, regardless of cultural or religious differences. In 1996, when Nigeria submitted its first report on the implementation of the Child Rights Convention to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, the committee recommended, amongst other recommendations, that Nigeria should ensure the domestication of the CRC for it to be fully implemented under Nigerian law. As a result, an elaborate first bill on child rights was drafted in 1993, but could not be passed into law by the military. Due to tremendous opposition from religious as well as cultural groups, Subsequently, a special committee was set up to harmonize children's bill with Nigeria's religious and customary beliefs. It is clear from the very beginning in Nigeria that the concept of child rights was never in harmony with Nigeria's cultural and religious beliefs. The opposition from religious and cultural groups indicated the Herculean task ahead in implementing child rights in Nigeria. It therefore looks counterintuitive that Nigeria signed a bill, a binding law that is in contradiction with the general beliefs of its people, so to speak. In conceptualizing the child rights in Nigeria, a right is either the liberty protected by law to act or abstain from acting in a certain manner, or the power to compel a specific person to do so or abstain from doing particular thing. It is well founded and when a given claim is recognized by civil law, it becomes an acknowledged claim or a legal right enforceable by the power of the state. The Supreme Court of Nigeria in the case of Odogo and Attorney General of the Federation held that a fundamental right is a right guaranteed in the Constitution that every person is entitled to enjoy by virtue of being a human being. From this, we can assert that by being a human being, a child is entitled to enjoy fundamental rights enshrined in whatever applicable law. The Convention on the Rights of the Child sets a standard that all children have the inalienable right to core minimum level of well-being. Infringement of this right is considered as subjection to poverty, which according to the United Nations General Assembly, is deprivation of nutrition, water, sanitation facilities, access to basic health care services, shelter, education, 
participation, and protection. It is worthy of emphasis that while a severe lack of goods and services hurts every human being, it is most threatening and harmful to children, leaving them unable to enjoy their rights, reach their full potential, and participate as full members of society. In other words, the child's inability to enjoy these rights is tantamount to denying the child the benefit of the four general principles that underpin children's rights, which are non-discrimination, their best interests of the child, the right to survival and development, as well as the respect to the views of the child, as has been alluded to above. All in all, children whose rights are protected are well nourished, mentally stable, and have a firm foundation from which they can develop to their fullest potentials. When children's rights are promoted and protected, societies and economies develop better. Children are the assurance of the continuity of human society. Without children today, there will be no society of humans tomorrow. Now, at the, on the Child Rights Act, you remember we used to have the children and young persons laws, which were the laws for the protection of children and young persons and for juvenile justice administration in the country. The Child Rights Act, however, was enacted into law in 2003 as the legislation to fully incorporate the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. This impo important legislative action was in respect response to Nigerians' commitment to the Convention, which was adopted in 1989 by the United Nations General Assembly. Thereafter, the African Union of Heads of States and Governments, in a swift reaction in July 1990, also adopted the African Union Chapter, Chapter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. These instruments set forth standards and principles for the survival, development, protection and participation of children and emphasize their recognition as important members of the, of the society whose rights are sacrosanct. More so, the Act is grounded on the four core principles of non-discrimination, devotion to the child's best interest, the right to life, survival and development, as well as respect for the views of the child. It provides a comprehensive framework for the protection of the rights of children in Nigeria. This covers broad protection and thematic issues that include the protection of children from exploitation, abuse and neglect, the right to education and access to health care, and the right to participate in the decisions that affect them. When you look at what is happening to children all over the country now, children are grossly abused. Child labor is rampant. Some children who are, who are house helps to some families, if you see the way they are being treated, some of them, some families will use hot iron on these children. Some of them will use pepper on their eyes and several horrible places on the body of the child. Some of them will use knives to mark the body of children. Some of the children are tortured. And these are the things the Child Rights Act has prohibited that these things should never be done to children. So despite the passage of this act and its adoption across the states, the existence of, and the existence of other laws such as the Violence Against Persons Provision Act 2015 and the Traffic in Persons Provision Law Enforcement and Administration Act of 2015, Nigeria, like other African countries, continues to grapple with inherently high incidence of child abuse and violence. This is because the Child Rights Law, the Child Rights Act, has been extensively challenged principally on various socio-cultural bases. Nigeria signed the CRC in 1989 and enacted the Child Rights Act in 2003 largely as a result of pressure from many national 
and international non-governmental organizations and the media. Nigeria failed to do necessary groundwork from the beginning, thereby resulting in the slow pace of the act implementation after the domestication. There are fundamental issues affecting the child in Nigeria, ranging from street hawking to child marriage, female genital mutilation, child trafficking, child labor, and other violent treatments meted out against the child in Nigeria. It is equally disturbing that children are multidimensionally poor and experience deprivation in terms of nutrition, health, education, water, sanitation, housing, and information. This has been made worse by insecurity, armed banditry, and separatist agitations and kidnapping. These factors have increased the number of out-of-school children, amongst other abuses. Thus, according to UNICEF, about 10.5 million children are out of school in Nigeria. Although primary school children is officially free in the country. This is a sad commentary on the state of well-being and welfare of the child in Nigeria. It casts a shadow on the implementation of child rights acts and child rights laws in different states in Nigeria. If 10.5 million children are out of school, what's going to be their future? What's going to be the future of Nigeria? We've already talked about the opportunities available to you because you are in school. We thank God for you. We thank God for you who are in school. These 10.5 million that are not in school, what is their future like? This should agitate all of us. This should bother all of us. As parents and as the leaders of tomorrow, you must take a decision that if you have an opportunity to make sure that every child goes to school like you, you will do it. As leaders of tomorrow, you must know that the opportunities available to you because you are going to school are 100 times more than that available to these 10.5 million who, don't, who are on the streets. It is, however, heartwarming that there have been some positive developments since the enactment of the child rights, such as the setting up of the Child Rights Implementation Committee at the national and subnational levels the establishment of the National Child Health Policy, the establishment of family courts, and other positive developments across the states. Now, the domestication of the Child Rights Act is based on requirement of Article 4 of the Convention. And this article provides that member states to the Convention shall undertake all appropriate legislative, administrative, and other measures for the implementation of rights recognized in the present convention. So it is noted that Nigeria operates a dualist legal system, and the effect thereof is that international law stands apart from national law. And this implies that for any convention to be part of Nigerian law, that convention must be passed in the parliament to be enacted as a Nigerian law. And this is the position of Section 12 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, which provides that no treaty between the Federation and any other country shall have the force of law except to the extent to which any such treaty has been enacted into law by the National Assembly. The Supreme Court in Abacha and Fawemi held that an international treaty entered into by the government of Nigeria does not become binding until enacted into law by the National Assembly. In the same vein, the Court of Appeal in whom was Minister of Health and Productivity and others alluded to the African Charter, which is incorporated into Nigeria's domestic law by the African Charter on Human and Peoples Ratification and Enforcement Act, and therefore binding. 
Thus, the Nigerian courts must give effect to it like all other laws falling within the judicial powers of the courts. The Nigerian Law Reform Commission presented an executive bill which aimed at enacting the principles encapsulated in the Convention and the, Convention and the Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child into law in Nigeria. This action was heralded by the concerns that were expressed by stakeholders in the country that drew attention to the need for comprehensive legislation to protect children. These stakeholders represented diverse interests from the government, international organizations, and the United Nations Children's Fund. The act is widely celebrated as a major victory for children's rights in Nigeria and has since been used to advance the cause of child protection and welfare in the country. Thus, a significant milestone has been achieved in the trajectory towards the protection of the rights of children in Nigeria, whereupon it established a uniform legal framework for the protection of children throughout the country. On the other hand, Nigeria's tripartite legal system poses a drawback to the Child Rights Act effectiveness. This is because the country's reliance on different sources of law, such as customary law, Sharia law, judicial precedents, and statutory law, often results in inconsistencies in certain issues, such as the definition of certain laws, certain terms in law. Also, because each state is given the flexibility to adapt the, the Child Rights Act to accommodate beliefs or customs peculiar to their region or jurisdiction, the efficacy of the Child Rights Act is somewhat watered down. This offers loopholes for some cultural and religious practices to still be entertained. This is the reason why child abuse is still prevalent despite the domestication of the Child Rights Act. It is noteworthy that issues of child rights protection are on the residual list of the 1999 Constitution, giving states exclusive responsibility and jurisdiction to make laws relevant to their specific situations. This, in, con, this is consequent upon Section 47 of the immediate Constitution, which provides that the House of Assembly of a state shall have the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of the state or any part thereof with respect to the following matters, that is to say, any matter not included in the exclusive legislative list set out in part one of the second schedule to this constitution. Any matter included in the concurrent legislative list set out in the first column of part two of the second schedule to this constitution to the extent prescribed in the second column opposite thereto. And C, any other matter in which it is empowered to make laws in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. Thus, having enacted at the national level, the Child Rights Act should be adopted by two-thirds of the 36 states of Nigeria to be applicable throughout the whole country. Hence, the Act and the laws at the state level ought to provide the platforms for effective promotion and protection of the rights of the child against all manner of unwholesome traditional religious or cultural practices that demean the status of children in the country. However, the question that needs an answer is how the states have been able to adapt the provisions of the Child Rights Act in order to make them applicable to better the condition of Nigerian children that has been weighed down by many years of unwholesome traditional religious and cultural practices. This is the preoccupation of the discourse within the immediate following segment. Implementation of the Child Rights Act and Child Rights Law in the States. 20 years after the enactment of the Child Rights Act in 2023 and the administration of the Child Rights Laws in the different states in Nigeria, it has become necessary to critically analyze the implementation of the Child Rights Act in relation to the provisions of implementation of the child rights laws in the states across the country. You know the difference between the Child Rights Act and the child rights laws. Like we said before, the child rights laws are the laws concerning children in the various states. 
whereas the Child Rights Act is the act made by the National Assembly to domesticate the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that Child Rights Act passed by the National Assembly is only applicable in the Federal Capital Territory. However, we expect that the child right laws made by the various states should be as similar as possible to the Child Rights Act at the center. Certain issues area, certain issue areas are selected and highlighted as the basis of comparison between the provisions of the Child Rights Act and the child rights laws domesticated across the states in Nigeria. The analysis also pertains to how the provisions of the Child Rights Act and the child rights laws are being implemented across the country. These issue areas will include, but not limited to the definition of a child, some unwholesome traditional practices such as child marriage and betrothal, as well as other cultural practices such as female genital mutilation, engraving of tattoos and skin marks on child's body, stigmatization based on witchcraft and other sociocultural issues that are specifically provided in the respective state child rights laws. Let us look at these issues one after the other. The definition of a child. The Child Rights Act 2003 in section 277 defines a child as a person under the age of 18 years. This definition is in line with Article 1 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 1989, and Article 2 of the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, 1990. Such states as Anambra, Enugu, Imo, Ebony, and River states adopted the Child Rights Act in its totality. Thus, their respective laws also recognize a child to be anyone below the age of 18 years. However, other states in Nigeria have promulgated laws that provide different definitions of a child, which are inconsistent with the letters and spirit of the Child Rights Act and international standards. For example, in Kaduna State, the Child Rights Law defines a child as any person below the age of 16 years. Similarly, in Kano State, the Child Rights Law defines a child as a person who has not attained puberty. And this is determined by circumstances of each case. This makes the law uncertain and leaves the determination of the age of a child of puberty at the whim and caprices of each case. And to this extent, implementation will be weak because the clause circumstances of each case gives unfettered discretion to those implementing the law as to who is a child under the law. This difference in the definition of a child across various states in Nigeria has, has significant implications for the protection of the rights of the child. A lower age limit for the definition of a child could mean that children are denied full protection and are exposed to harm, abuse, and exploitation. For instance, child marriage or betrothal could be encouraged with the implications highlighted under the EBS segment below. In addition to the definitional problem in relation to the age bracket of a child, as provided under the child rights of different states of Nigeria, there are also cultural practices that are inconsistent with international standards as analyzed above. Child marriage and child betrothal. Child marriage and child betrothal are prevalent practices in parts of the northern Nigeria. Children about the age of 10 or 12 years get betrothed or married off. It has been reported that in many parts of Nigeria, young mothers are exposed to violence and lack of health care, nutrition, and education. This translates to a high number of human rights violations. Section 21 of the Child Rights Act provides that no person under the age of 18 years is capable of contracting a valid marriage. And accordingly, a marriage so contracted is null and void and of no effect whatsoever. 
It also prohibits child betrothal in Section 22 and renders a betrothal in, in contravention of Section 21 void. A person in contravention of Section 21 and 22 is to pay a fine of 500,000 or imprisonment for a term of five years or both. However, some of the child rights laws have watered down the provisions for punishment for child marriage and betrothal. For example, under Section 23 of the Child Rights Law of Lagos State 2007, the fine for child marriage is 50,000. This is the same position in Niger State, in Nasarawa State, and in Oshun State. All these bring about the weak implementation of the law because some unscrupulous persons may choose to pay a small fine and marry an underage girl. On the contrary, some states have enacted laws that blatantly conflict with the Child Rights <coughs> Act. Some states have enacted laws that blatantly conflict with the Child Rights Act 2003. For instance, Section 29.4b of the Zamfara State Child Rights Law 2013 permits girls to be married at the age of 14, while the boys can marry at the age of 16 without the consent of their parents or guardians. Thus, there is no prohibition of child marriage or betrothal. In Casina State, the Casina State Child Rights Protection Law 2019 allows under Section 46 for the marriage of girls with the consent of their parents or guardians, contrary to the provisions of the Child Rights Act 2003. This is also the situation in Kaduna State, as Section 24.3 of the Child Protection Law 2018 allows a child who is 14 years old to consent to marriage. The Kano State Child Right Protection Bill is awaited, is, has already been assented to by the governor and puts the age of consent to marry under Section 16.3 as 14 years. And in this way, it allows child marriage in the state. The 1999 Constitution is also in agreement with the age of 18 years as the age of majority, that's full age as provided under Section 29.4a. It, however, provides under Section 29.4b that any woman who is married shall be deemed to be of full age. So one can easily infer a twisted justification for child marriage from this section. Thus, there is need for the legislature to amend this section in order to do away with the culture of child marriage in the country which is, as it were, encouraged by the Constitution and various, various child rights laws. The implication of all this is that children are given out for marriage when they are not mentally and physically right for it. In other words, they are not physically, physiologically, and psychologically ready for marriage. Thus, the child is deprived of the right to education as there is a likelihood of limited education attainment, the right to health is infringed as many of the children suffer vesico vaginal fistula, VVF, and pregnancy related death, and of course, the right to general development or well being. A further implication of lowering the Child Rights Act and international thresholds is with regard to the legal age of the child and the child rights laws in the northern states in Nigeria, as against the provision of the child rights laws of the southern states, is that these states are the most educationally backward and have the highest rate of children, child marriage in Nigeria. Thus, child marriage is predominant in northern Nigeria as a girl from the northern part of Nigeria is likely to marry at the age of 15, as against her counterpart 
of the age of 20 in the south. You find out that in southern Nigeria, most girls are likely not to marry before the age of 20. In the light of this, these girls involved in early marriage conundrum drop out of school if they are in school or may not be encouraged to go to school at all as they are culturally prepared for marriage. The result is the high number of out-of-school children in these states with obvious consequences for human development, such as being disposed to discrimination and violence, prevention from participating in economic, political, and social life. Now, let us look at the issue of female genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation, female genital mutilation, okay, is also known as female circumcision or female genital cutting. And it's a harmful cultural practice that greatly violates the rights of a child against torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. This is mostly carried out on young girls between infancy and the age of 15. This practice involves a partial or total removal of external female genital and or injury to the female genital organs, whether for any non-therapeutic or cultural reasons, or is carried out for various cultural reasons such as maintenance of chastity and virginity before marriage, increasing the sexual pleasure of the husbands, fidelity during marriage, and intake of women into womanhood. The Child Rights Act does not make provision for FGM at all. This is despite the allegation of the practice of FGM on a wide scale across the states, including Bayelsa, Delta, Ebony, Edo, Ogun, Ondo, Oshu, Ekiti, Kwara, Kugi, Adamawa, Benue, Borono, Kano, Kaduna, Kasina, Nasarawa, Naija, and Sokoto states. However, some of the states have made specific provisions for female genital mutilation. Despite these legal provisions, the practice of female genital mutilation persists in some parts of Nigeria as implementation and enforcement of state laws are weak throughout the country. In addition, it has not been possible to identify any successful prosecutions. Thus, there is need for more sensitization campaigns, greater enforcement and implementation of the laws. There is the need to continue to bring to the notice of everyone the dangers inherent in the continual practice of female genital mutilation. The knowledge about the harmful effect of female genital mutilation and the legal provisions prohibiting it will help to bring down the prevalence of negative culture across the country. Tattoos and skin marks. This is the cultural practice prevalent among the Yoruba, Hausa, and few other ethnic groups in Nigeria. Tattoos and skin marks now fall under the category of harmful traditional practices that affect children in Nigeria. According to the Child Rights Act 2003, no person shall tattoo or make a skin mark or cause any tattoo or skin mark to be made on a child. Stigmatization based on witchcraft and religious practices. Belief in the existence and powers of witches, especially among the people of Cross River, Akwai Bom, Adamawa, Bronu, Yobe, Taraba, and Eastern states of Nigeria have contributed to the abuse and exploitation of children in these states. Terms such as Obanje or Abiku are used to tag children as symbols of evil omen because they are believed to be possessed or reincarnated. In 2010, data from cases recorded in Akwaibon State indicated that around 80% of children are abandoned or forced out of their homes following an accusation of witchcraft. This increased their vulnerability to even more violations, including lack of access to food, water, shelter, and education. This is despite the provision of the Child Rights Act and Child Rights Laws against any form of discrimination against the child. Let us look at prof prospects of good implementation. Notwithstanding these identified implementation challenges, 
there are prospects for the good implementation of the child rights laws in Nigeria. To this extent, although civil servants, industrialists, traders differed in the assessment of the implementation of child rights laws in the country, all of them agreed that the implementation of the child rights laws was slightly above average at 68.75%. But this can only be better where policies and infrastructure provided under the law for implementation are followed to their letter and spirit. And where such policies and structures are not provided, the law should be amended to accommodate them. Safety provisions for good implementation of child rights laws across the country are discussed under the immediate following subheads. There is the Child Rights Implementation Committee. Both the Child Rights Act and the Child Rights Law provide for Child Rights Implementation Committee. The states have enacted, that have enacted the Child Rights Laws have established the Child Rights Implementation Committee, and these are across the various ministries and parastatals. There is the establishment of the Family Courts. Another important infrastructure for the implementation of Child Rights Laws is, in, is the establishment of, of the Family Courts. For instance, Benue, Kaduna, Ondo, Lagos, and the Federal Capital Territory have family courts. Also, Lagos State, FCT, and Kaduna have developed Child Rights Act enforcement procedural rules. But these structures, are they well utilized? The government has shown some commitment to the implementation of the Act. In 2020, the Federal Executive Council approved a new policy on child protection, which aims at addressing the issue of child abuse and neglect in the country. Let us look at the issue of orphanages. Orphanages provide a safe and nurturing environment for vulnerable children who have lost parental care. The Child Rights Act recognizes the important role of orphanages in protecting the rights of vulnerable children and provides guidelines for the establishment and operation. Section 219 of the Child Rights Act states that orphanages, child care centers, and other res residential facilities for children must be licensed and registered by appropriate government agency and must meet certain minimum standards for the care and protection of children. These standards include, these standards include provisions for nutrition, health care, education, recreation, as well as measures to prevent abuse of children. Let us look at bustle institutions. Bustle institutions are children who are in conflict with the law. Children in conflict with the law are not supposed to be sent to formal prison because experience has shown that formal prison will expose them to, to become more hardened than criminalized. However, Nigeria currently has only three bustle institutions in Kaduna, Abiokuta, and in Loring here. So children in conflict with the law are now kept in adult correctional facility and exposed to crimes to which otherwise would not, they would not have known. Let us look at holding institutions. There is need to examine the effect of holding or training facilities that end up torturing and degrading the humanity of children, like some, some uh, Almajiri Quranic institutions and other rehabilitation homes. You remember, there was some time in Kaduna and in Kasina some of these institutions, the state has not been monitoring them, which is, which is wrong. When you establish some of these institutions, you have to make sure that you know what is happening there. Because it was discovered that some of the children in these places are abandoned. Some of them are even chained. Some of them were fine to be in chains, and this is not good for the upbringing of the children. So the National Human Rights Commission, what we did, when we saw that situation, we decided to approach all the state governments to review the licenses they had granted to all these institutions and to set the standard for what is happening there to make sure that these institutions are monitored, to make sure that from time to time there are inspectors who go to these institutions to make sure that children are not tortured, children are rather taught there, children are educated there, children are equipped to be better human beings in future, instead of you know, turning those centers into torture centers, which is what has been happening. In conclusion, this article has demonstrated that although the federal government 
has jettisoned the children and young persons law across the country, which is that was deployed to deal with children and adolescents in conflict with the law and domesticated the Child Rights Act 2003, an offshoot of the Convention on the Rights of the Child that models international best practices of human rights tenets and non supportation of the child. However, the Child Rights Act and its counterpart child rights laws face whose challenges in the implementation process in the country because of cultural and religious beliefs that conflict with child rights. In addition, insufficient resources, inadequate political will, and poor coordination among implementing agencies are also the drawback to the will of implementation of these laws. But with the right strategies and support, it is possible to harmonize the different interests in order to promote and protect welfare and well-being of children in Nigeria. And we, may, we should recommend that the government and every tier in the country must demonstrate a genuine commitment to the protection of children's rights by allocating sufficient resources to implement the child rights laws. This will involve providing adequate funding for agencies and structures responsible for the protection of the children and implementation of the child rights laws, such as the National Agency for the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons, the National Human Rights Commission, Child Rights Implementation Committees, and the Family Courts. Furthermore, there is need for effective collaboration between government agencies, civil society organizations, institutions, and other stakeholders. Collaboration is essential in ensuring that the provision of the child rights laws are effectively enforced and the rights of children are protected. Government agencies responsible for the implementation of child rights laws must work closely, must work closely with each other and with CSOs to provide support for vulnerable children and ensure that their rights are protected. Additionally, there is need for awareness campaigns and education programs aimed at educating the public, especially parents and guardians, on the provision of the child rights laws. This will help to ensure that they understand their responsibilities in protecting the rights of the children and the consequences of violating these rights. It will also encourage communities to report cases of child abuse, neglect, violence, exploitation to the appropriate authorities. All this will fasten the pace of the implementation of promotion of child rights laws across the states for the betterment of Nigerian child. Thank you very much. Shall we rise in ovation for the guest lecturer? Whoever has been a child before in his life, no matter what you are now, you are once a child. Let's rise on our feet for this wonderful, eye-opening, thought-provoking lecture given by no any other person than the Executive Secretary himself of National Human Rights Commission, Abuja, Chief Anthony Ojuku, SAN. Thank you very much. Shall we have our seats? Now, having listened to this very thought-provoking lecture, and um, in view of our time constraints in Alikma University, given the fact that we are in exam period, and in the next few minutes now, the azan to the Zul prayer will be called. We would like to entertain one or two questions to make further clarification in the next five minutes before we move to the presentation of the Institute of Shattered uh, Arbitrator and Conciliator. Let's have one or two questions, please. It will be numbered one, two, three. I think that solves it. Two here, one here. Also, sir, I should go. We have three questions. Uh, signify three questions, okay, please, because of time. Three questions, okay, please, because of time. Except we are just trying to manage the time now. Anyway, if it should be brief, let's take that last question over there. Baba, question also. Question? Okay, but before the questions, I have the honor to give the, uh, the vice. Deputy Vice Chancellor, the microphone to make 
a few comments or addendum to the lecture. We have seen, we've heard, that the lecture is very loaded. And it's going to be a long-lasting guidance in policy formulation and implementation. My own um, comment, rather on the recommendation of the lecturer, where he emphasized the imperative of collaboration. And, and I think it is worthwhile to have something permanent in the university. Imagine from this lecture as a consequence. I'm thinking that we should, in collaboration with the Commission, establish a center for human rights and governance studies to be overseen by the Faculty of Law. I hope uh, I'm at home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I've always said it's time for that number, that the DVC was one time uh, a tenant in the building of Faculty of Law. I'm sure when it was the Dean PG School, uh, every faculty in, the, in that building knows that they are tenants to Faculty of Law, charging for the rent unpaid. Thank you very much, sir, for that beautiful comment. Now, let's have the question one after the other. The lady here, can you please come out? Extra microphone, yeah? Okay, come and have this. Um, good afternoon. My name is Yahya Muniret. I am a 400 level student. And my question is, is there any need for the amendment of the Child Rights Act in Nigeria? And does it have anything to do with the reasons why Child Rights Act still doesn't apply throughout Nigeria? That's my question, sir. Please, your question is definitely Okay, sir. Yes, is there any need for the amendment of the Child Rights Act in Nigeria? And does it have anything to do with the reasons why Child Rights Act still doesn't apply throughout Nigeria? Probably, did you get the... Give the question. Give the mic to Prof. Okay. The Dean of Law, Kora University, Malete, SAN. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I observe the existing protocol? I'll just go straight to ask our guest lecturer. Incidentally, we went to movie together and I had a lot of discussions and uh, I enjoy that journey because you didn't allow us to to suffer for the four hours as we are going and coming. Thank you so much. Sir, going straight. Um, as somebody who is in the real beat of this situation, have you considered this situation as to how you can really push in the federal government, especially the federal government, not the states, for serious funds as NDDC are funded specifically for the implementation of child rights and most especially with regards to their, their education. Why I'm saying this sincerely is that if you see the Almanjiri school, the main bottom line of what caused most of these Almanjiri problems is because of poverty. Whether to their parents to the teachers of the Almanjiri school, or even to the Almanjiris themselves. That, if it's implemented, it will go a long way to really, in terms of what the, uh, the result you will get, it will, it, will, it will push it forward. And that will have been, I think that area is necessary. If really you want to attack the Almanjiri in that regard, including other schools, especially those vulnerable. Number two, have you, also, have you also looked at it with regards to 
the issue has seen that when you push all these child rights and child law into one particular compendium, either for the state or for federal government, it may not really all go well without pushing some of them straight into the Constitution, whichever way you have to manage and lobby for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. The next question, please. And next, after him, to please be ready. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> My name is Sulaiman Jami, a third level student of Faculty of Law, Alikman State University. I first of all acknowledge the presence of um, all dignitaries and personalities present here today, whose names are my mouth are not worthy to pronounce. Without much further ado, my question, sir, is that in the course of your lecture, sir, you said this uh, movement about the Child Rights Act started with the Convention of the Rights of the Child, and a UN instrument which was passed in 1989. And in Nigeria, being a subscriber to that instrument, in 2003, enacted the Child Rights, Child Rights Act in 2003. And going by the um, constitutional you know, design of um, the country, this act will not be um, applicable in states of the federation, of federation unless they have been domesticated in these states. Um, on the first page of this book, Share to Us All, I realized that it was stated that, that not all the states have domesticated the Child Rights Act. As a matter of fact, those that have domesticated it, some have modified it in accordance with cultural and religious um, beliefs. And going by the um, nature of, territorial nature of laws that they are only enforceable within the territory in which they are enacted, save for certain circumstances. Which means that children domiciled in states that have not enacted the Child Rights Act will not enjoy the protection of these rights. Now, my question is, what measure can you suggest that the government at the federal level should take to ensure that those states that are refusing to enact this act and those that have modified this act, not in accordance with the original Child Rights Act, should do to ensure that they do it the proper way so as not to um, deprive the children the enjoyment of these rights? Thank you very much. The next person to you there, the last person, yes. Yes, that is the president, LSS himself. No, sir. President. Oh, deputy president. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not the president, but deputy president. Sir. Go ahead, your question, please. So, my name is Mustafa Abdul Rashid. Um, okay. 200 level student. Okay, sorry. Uh, my question is that does the non justiciability of the fundamental objective and directive, state, uh, directive principle of state policy? An aberration to the Child Rights Act. The Constitution provides for educational objective, and it provides that everybody shall have free edu primary education, free university education, and free adult literacy program. So, in such situations whereby this particular section is not justifiable by virtue of Section 6 sub 6c of the Constitution, can that particular can we see that as an aberration to the Child Rights Act, to the application of the Child Rights Act? Thank you very much. Very much. Can we have the microphone here? The last question by Professor S. A. Bello here. Baba, your question. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> the Child Rights Act is highly beneficial to everybody, to every parent. This lecture of today is highly beneficial to all parents. But the unfortunate aspect of it is that those parents that keep away about 10 million Nigerian children out of school who are roaming about are presently, this moment, at markets in Norfa and other places. They are not here. Therefore, going by the last paragraph of your lecture, the last paragraph of page 27, where you recommended that there must be awareness campaign, it is my belief that uh, your unit, the unit of the Human Rights Commission throughout Nigeria, particularly in Kwara State, ably represented by our good lady, should now take it as their burden to launch the awareness campaign to wherever these people are. Otherwise, the Child Rights Act, beneficial artists, 
your lecture beneficial as it is, we also go down like the uh, children's law, which you uh, advise to on page six to seven of your law as having very low patronage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Baba, for that question. The microphone now goes to the guest lecturer for answers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited about the questions, especially the one from the students, because uh, it shows me that uh, it's really working on their minds already. Um, the first comment was um, by the DVC, which is heartwarming, that as a result of this um, activity today, uh, we're looking forward to establishing a center for human rights in the university. I think that's a very positive note to start. Thank you very much uh, for the university for this. We'll give you, you all our support to make sure that the center works. I don't even mind coming from all the way from Abuja to, to participate in the activities of the center. The first, uh, the young lady asked whether there will be any need to amend the, the Child Rights Act. And um, she also asked the reason why it is not applicable uh, everywhere in Nigeria. Of course, when we went through the lecture today, you find out that the, the Child Rights Act tried. But something like female genital mutilation is not in the Child Rights Act. But what has happened is that the states that have not incorporated things like the female genital mutilation in their child rights laws have passed other laws on female genital mutilation. So the Child Rights Act as it is now is quite comprehensive enough. And if we can even implement what is there, it was a very hard negotiation no, to get to that stage. It was a very, very, very hard negotiation to be able to get to the Child Rights Act we have today. So um, I think um, if we are talking of area of, um, of um, amendment, I would, I would link it to what my learned brother Silk uh, suggested uh, I, in terms of um, providing enough resources for its implementation. I, I, I can tell you one of the major challenges we had when we were passing the Child Rights Act was costing the implementation of the Child Rights Act. I think it was only legal state that was able to cost their own implementation of the, their Child Rights uh, law. But at the federal level, it was a tough one. And we felt that that was going to discourage the federal government from passing it. You know, is, 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 is huge. Investing in children is like investing in, in, the, in, 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 in our future as a country. There was also the suggestion that we should have a child rights commission so that this, just like you have uh, Minister of Women Affairs, you have commission for persons in, with disability, you now have a senior citizen center the argument was, why can't we have a child rights commission that the whole purpose of that would be to look at the issue of making sure that the welfare of children are really... I think the argument um, is still on. Uh -huh. uh, it's just that the issue of multiplicity of agencies is a challenge. Uh, there are dwindling resources in the country. However, the argument then was that the the government had passed the Universal Basic Education Act, which makes education to a certain level free. So should we, and because children is not on the exclusive legislative list, which is only the responsibility of the federal government, the state government also have a responsibility. And this is very important because you cannot totally ignore the need for some cultural, religious differences. If you ignore them, it may create more problems. 
we look at these cultures and religious differences and take the positive sides that can grow Nigeria for development. So, I would say that the Child Rights Act as it is now uh, is quite comprehensive. Uh, all we need is to, to see how we can source funding for its full implementation. Uh, if there's any amendment that we've made, I'll be making an amendment so that um, I was listening to television uh, yesterday and they said, they were discussing about taxes, they said so much taxation. But if we are to tax all the companies to release 1% of their profit so that we use it to deal with the issue of implementation of child rights, I think it would be a very worthy investment in this country. Then there was the issue of um, the Amajiri schools. This has been a very, a very, very uh, big challenge. For us at the commission, we are committed to providing education for Amajiri children. That was why when we learned that some of the, for instance, some of the Korani schools where these Amajiri children are supposed to, to go to, we are not being taken care of by the state governments that license them. You, you don't license a school and you will not ask what is happening there. Because most uh, people who are doing these things are also businessmen. <laughs> they, they are doing these things. I know the religious, and it's just like some of the churches we have now, some of them are businesses. So while they preach, while they preach the, the gospel, they are also looking at your tithes and uh, the, 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 the daily contributions. So some of the people who are also you know, establishing these schools are also looking at the economic side of it. So government cannot license these institutions without monitoring. You must monitor to make sure that what you have approved to be done there is what is actually going there. Because what we discovered was horrible. I'm sure some of you read about them. You, you went to some of those schools, the children there are sitting on top of fields. Some of them were in cuffs. Some of them were as lean as anything, malnourished. That was not why they were being sent there by their parents. Some of them, their parents who want to go and visit them, they will not allow them to come in. That is not proper. So, so I think at a, at a stage, during Jonathan's, uh, President Jonathan's time, there was encouragement to establish emergency schools all over. But it didn't prosper, really. You know, we are trying to investigate that, but I think the government is coming back to it once more now. It is very, very important. We cannot allow our children to be on the streets. Our study, for instance, on one of the um, causative or supply factors for terrorism during the Boko Haram showed that there were some children who were joining Boko Haram for commercial reasons because they were being paid. They had nothing to do. If those children were in school, they were not going to take 5,000 and go and uh, join suicide bombers. So, so education is very important. It's, it's easier to rule. Look at because all of you are educated now. That's why the vice chancellor can say, "Come and sit down here," and everybody will sit down. That's why we, we are going to say, "It is time for prayer." We'll go and pray. After prayer, we decide to come back. When you are educated, it's easy to pass instructions. It's easy to govern. It's easy to live together. You tolerate. You tolerate better. You understand that this person has his own right, and his own right ends where my own begins. For an uneducated mind, it's all selfish. He, he just knows himself only. So he cannot, education helps us to tame, to control our desires, our wants, our relationships. Education is everything. Without education, I wonder how the world will be like. So we have to do everything. Because unless we educate the Amadri children, it's not complete. Because if somebody is not educated, 
is a threat to you that is educated. That is why I said, I'm happy we came to an academic institution. What things like, why you are the best crowd, why you are the best audience, is that this is going to agitate your mind. As you grow, as you finish your education, as you become the future attorney generals, the future senior advocates, the future governors, the future House of Assembly members, what you have had here today is going to help you to be a better Nigerian. So we are all in for education that is centered towards helping the Amaji children get some decent livelihood, get some decent education, because it will be in the best interest of all of us. If one of us is not educated, it is not our, in our interest. If everybody is educated, we we'll all benefit better from it. There was the issue of uh, the need to align the provisions of the Child Rights Act with the Constitution. I agree that really one other way to make it applicable nationwide is to make it a constitutional provision. But my brothers and sisters, you know the process of amendment of the Nigerian Constitution is so difficult. It's so difficult that it will be an uphill task. I can almost bet you. Because if you see what we are going through in negotiating the child rights laws of the different states, you, you, you marvel. You marvel. Because I can't understand myself how a parent who, well, you see, that's another thing with education. If you are educated, you will not want to give away your daughter at the age of 12. But if you are not educated, you are a pan tapa or a farmer in the village, you you probably be looking at who is going to help the family, who is going to assist in this, uh, so that the girl will not be wayward, <laughs> you know? Maybe we think that uh, if the girl stays at home. So the things we'll be considering will be so different. And financial gains too. The family is having problem. The rainy season is coming. They have tax roof. Uh, water is leaking. If we marry this girl off now, maybe the husband will come and help us to roof this house and will no longer be suffering on that. So the considerations are so different. And these are human factors. You can't ignore them. So it boils down to education again. We go down to education again. So it is best to have these children issues protected in the Constitution, protected in the Constitution, but then um, is a wishful thinking because I don't know whether our National Assembly as constituted can really allow them to go. Um, you say that not all states have passed. How can, the, the federal government cannot compel the states to, to, another way is if we remove children issues from the residual list and put them on the exclusive list, in which case, automatically, the Child Rights Act becomes applicable all over the country. But the argument will be hot. I can, I can bet you <laughs> to do that, it will be hot. Now, the justiciability of the Child Rights Act and uh, the issue uh, posed by the Chapter 2 of the Constitution is interesting because and, and the, he tried to link it with the right, of right to education, which is one of the fundamentals of, of, um, of uh, the rights of the child, right to survival, right to education, right to participation, and right to non-discrimination. So he's saying that if right to education is a right and is not enforceable under Chapter 2 of the Constitution, how do you deal with that? That's very interesting. However, you know that right to education is now made enforceable because of the passage of the Universal Basic Education Act. So the Constitution says that even though it's not enforceable, but you can make laws to make them enforceable. And that has been done in the Universal Basic Education Act. So education at a certain level in Nigeria now is compulsory. So it's not a contradiction. You know, the, the, the non-justiciability of Chapter 2 does not affect the rights of the child 
when it comes to the issue of right education. Then he also mentioned uh, the need for NHRC in, um, in uh, Elori to really go to the audience, to go to the marketplaces where they can see our parents. We have uh, a sensitization program which entails going to talk to market women, going to talk at the motor parks, going to talk to organizing town hall meetings. So what I would say is the coordinator has taken note of that, and I'm sure you will scale up um, your advocacy, your sensitization programs, so that every household needs to understand. If it is possible, the child rights law of, uh, of um, uh, Quara State, maybe if we can find somebody to collaborate with and mass produce them, if possible, if it can be interpreted in the local language, you know. But I know that even most times people don't read these things. So if you can organize town hall meetings, you know, local government by local government, and talk to people so as to sensitize them, that will help. I think it is time to go and pray now. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I believe we all have the understanding now and the clarification taken from the lecture. We pray God to reward Chief Anthony Ojuku SAN and return him back to his destination safely, inshallah. Now, the next program quickly before the Salat is inviting out to the podium here Dr. Adiola Adams, the Vice President of the Institute of Shattered Mediators and Christophe Nigeria. FCT Abuja to take us through the next brief program. Doctor, please. I will not give you time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, please uh, permit me to stand on the existing protocol because of our time. I will appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, the slide is on, but um, notwithstanding, let me thank the Vice Chancellor and the Dean of uh, Faculty of Law for giving me this uh, rare privilege to come and share our experiences around ICMC with our students. Um, the, can it be projected, please? Okay, next slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's about ADR, which many have given different appellations alternative dispute resolution, appropriate dispute resolution, amicable dispute resolution, African dispute resolution, assisted dispute resolution. What they all refer to is all the mechanism and processes that we de developed uh, to resolve dispute outside the courtroom uh, litigation in this case. Please, can we move to the next one? Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, because ADR is a movement in the contemporary times, I want to see how our students, especially law students, can key into this movement. Uh, there is a section of, uh, the, of lawyers who see ADR as alarming drop in revenue. Alarming drop in revenue. Uh, they find it difficult to reconcile with the ideals of ADR because they feel that they will actually lose, you know, uh, it will diminish their revenue and they will not be able to charge, you know, the, their professional fees. But this is not the case because quite a lot of lawyers are losing client because of improper representation. And I think the very smart lawyers now are embracing ADR as a way of advancing uh, public interest and, of course, the interests of their client. The next one. Okay, uh, we are citing here the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, who actually proposed to the uh, law school that coppers, that is, law students at the law school, should not be deployed to. Uh, law firm that are not ADR compliant. And this is to show the seriousness of what ADR means to the judiciary of today. Any lawyer, 
any aspiring lawyer who is not grounded in ADR is not likely to go very far, even with litigation. And you can see people are now moving away from adversarial in some, in some cases. So there's need for you to equip yourself with these new skills. Please, now we move to the next one. Uh, we can see ADRO processes. Arbitration, adjudication, judicial appraisal, expert determination, and so and so forth. We also have uh, the hybrid, whether it is made up or up made. Now we have what we call um, lit neg or lit made, combination of litigation and mediation or negotiation as the case may be. So uh, all these are there not to challenge litigation, but to complement the great work that litigation is actually coming out with. And it is when you have all this operating within a system, that is where you can have what we call effective dispute resolution, EDR. Next slide, please. Okay, um, there is this general um, tension between interest and right. Litigation is to protect right. Mediation is to protect interest. There is no tension between uh, mediation and other uh, or ADR processes and litigation because what all of them are trying to do is how to advance justice. When you incorporate ADR, what you have done is that you are trying to have a comprehensive sense of justice because essentially litigation focuses on retributive justice whereas ADR is very concerned about restorative justice. Other call it distributive justice. Uh, as you can see, or, you know, there, when you have ADR operating with litigation, uh, most of the cases that you have will have to call win-win outcome. Uh, but you know, um, when you take cases to court, the probability of having a win-win outcome is very, very remote. You are, like, you are most likely going to go with win-lose. And that is one of the reasons why this is being brought to you. The next slide, please. So why ADR? There's so many um, benefits of ADR uh, because we've been having delay, injustice, uh, under the traditional system of uh, just prohibitive costs, case congestion, restrictive one option, unsatisfactory outcome, uh, relationship are ruined. Please, can we move to the next one? Uh, and of course, this is just a result that shows the, the, uh, the, the, the duration of, um, you know, expi uh, of carrying out land cases in court. Uh, if you calculate a case in high court, it's saying 16.2. When it gets, if it is land cases, you spend 16.2. If it is other civil cases, 10.4. Criminal cases will go, you know, as far as seven years. So what we are saying is that the intervention of ADR is not only going to reduce the dockets in our court, it will also help us you know, to speed the process. So who is a smart lawyer in today's rating? A smart lawyer is the one who has the toolkit of all the processes of ADR. And if you are a lawyer, then you have an advantage to those who are non-lawyers. So uh, that's the modern concept of a lawyer, a dynamic lawyer, is the one who is ADR compliant. Thank you. Next one. Uh, support for ADR. We have rules of professional conduct for lawyers. I'm sure that most of you uh, are familiar with this, uh, which actually re require every lawyer to explore, you know, uh, mechanism of ADR before pushing certain cases, you know, to court. Uh, next one. Uh, we have legal backing for ADR. Uh, for instance, you can see FCT rules, order 19, is recommending arbitration, conciliation, and mediation, and other processes that can help to complement the work of uh, the great work of litigation. Next one, uh, we have High Court, uh, High Court of Lagos, order 25. We have the recently passed Arbitration and Mediation Act. This was passed barely a month ago. And this is to suggest to us that we have, you know, uh, legal support for ADR. And we have institutional support, like the multi-door courthouses that we 
that have been replicated in several states. Uh, we are still looking forward to Quara State to do this, and we know that movement can start from Al Hikma University. We have citizen rights and mediation centers, and of course, we have professional association, including lawyers that are reputable. Within their chambers, now they have a unit devoted to ADR. And I know by the time you graduate, these are the kind of things you should be looking forward to. Now, and that's one of the ways of trying to bridge that is coming of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators. Next slide, please. Uh, the Chartered Institute of Mediators and Conciliators is the professional body of mediators uh, that regulates the practice of mediation in Nigeria. It trains, accredits, and inducts prospective members, you know, uh, to be certified mediators. And it focuses primarily on training, regulation, and practice of mediation and conciliation. The vision is to build world-class professionals in alternative dispute resolution, especially mediation, in order to build a peaceful and harmonious society. Uh, the mission statement, uh, please, can we skip that? I, I will skip that. The institutional objectives, training of individuals, regulating the practice, helping to design dispute system mechanism for organizations, developing early warnings, because we don't have to wait until there is a full-blown conflict or dispute before we begin to intervene. These are some of the you know, uh, core objectives of uh, ICMC. Can we move to the next slide? Next one. Next one, okay, ICMC, generally. These are just the basic information about ICMC. Uh, the bill at the National Assembly was passed in 2015. It was represented, it was represented, and it was again passed in 2017. The bill is actually waiting for a presidential, and very soon this will also uh, be passed. Next one. Uh, we have our board of trustees, interestingly, the board of trustees are dominated by reputable lawyers in Nigeria, as you can see. Uh, next one, the national president, that is Barista Dr. Agada Elachi. Uh, the registrar is also Barista Aisha Ado Abdullahi. We have two deputy presidents, as you can see them, uh, Omoaka S.A.N., and Chukwemeka Eze, the second vice president. We have other national officers, as you can see. I'm proud to be one of them. Uh, ICMC has a structure in 19 states of the Federation. So if you look up and your state is not represented here, I, I challenge you to do something about it. Uh, we're ready to work with you in order to institute a structure in your state. Uh, but I can tell you, Okay, can we move to the next one? Uh, we have trainings. Uh, we have the accreditation training, international mediation training, uh, international leadership course. We have the fellowship course. We also have training of trainers for those who want to become, who want to pursue their career through trainings. We also have specialized courses on strategic negotiation, resources for managing workplace conflict, managing communal conflicts, and we also have continued ADR courses for members. Uh, this is the scope and content of our accreditation course. Uh, we have conflict analysis, spectrum of ADR, communication skill, human psychology and personality types, strategic negotiation, mediation skills, conciliation articles, professional ethics uh, and code of ethics for mediators, Introduction to arbitration, restorative justice, role plays, video presentation, and of course we have the accreditation examination. Uh, ICMC has partnership cut across many reputable organizations in Nigeria, in Africa, and beyond. And uh, I am proud this morning when the guest lecturer appear. Uh, on the crest of ICMC. Uh, I'm so proud, sir, and I recognize you very specially, sir. Uh, the lecturer of today is a fellow of 
the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators. Uh, thank you so much, uh, our dean, for bringing our role model to challenge our students. Uh, we have trained quite a number of uh, stakeholders in the justice system. As you can see, all the judges in most states across the country have been trained. They literally surrendered themselves to be trained. Uh, some of them were taken abroad. We are also training about, we, we conduct training for about 30 five universities across the country. As I speak to you, there are three trainings going on with students of university from various uh, departments. And we feel that it is a, it's a good thing for us to bring it to Al Hikima University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamdams, for that uh, presentation. And I'm sure our students are now well acquainted with all IMC, ICMC, what it's all about, and the ADR eventually. Now, we are going down the ladder of the program gradually. And the next now is for the presentation of awards. Presentation of awards. In Alikma University, we have a way of saying thank you mostly to our guests and invited dignitaries. I will most humbly invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor, every representing the Vice Chancellor here, to present the special award and gallants to the guest lecturer, Chief Anthony Ojuku, SAN, to please also step forward for his award and a token gift from Alikima University, from the founder, and as well as the university management. The DPC, sir. You're presenting the awards and also the gallants to the guest lecturer. Our distinguished lecturer of today, this is an award in recognition of what we have done in the history of Faculty of Law of Alikma University. This is to appreciate your coming and what you have uh, done in terms of uh, impartation of knowledge to the students and all those present here. We thank you very much. Also, from the founder of Alikma University, is in our tradition when we host a guest, we have to appreciate him with something else so that you continue to uh, remember Alikma University. Thanks. Yes, the founder's uh, autobiography is inside, so you can appreciate. Uh, so. That is a humble way in Alikma of saying thank you, sir. But before you take your seat, my DPC, sir, my DPC, sir, Prof, before you take your seat, I think the next gallant goes to the founder of this university, ably represented by Professor Sulaiman Muhammad Jamu, to come out for the founder's gallant, presented by the DPC. The Faculty of Law also appreciates our founder. And we would like to present this to him through you as a worthy proxy today. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, sir, for honoring the invitation. And we are sure this will pass to the founder. The chairman of the occasion, Malam Yusuf Olaulali, SAN, represented by Mr. Nurudin Adeboyega, he has gone. Mr. Taragba, should please step forward to take it on his behalf. It's all right. Thank you. Mr. Taragba is taking these gallons on behalf of the chairman of this occasion, Malam Yusuf Walaulu Ali, SAM. Please. Thank you very much. The guest of honor of today's occasion, former Chief Justice of, the, of High Court of Quarter States, Justice S.D. Kawu, to be taken in his absence by Professor Amoda Koneke for Justice Kau. Uh, Now, I invite the chairman of the planning committee of this ceremony, Professor S. A. Bello, to please step forward to present the Vice Chancellor Gallants. Professor Bello, please. That is the chairman of this planning committee is to present the gala to the vice chancellor and is to be taken by the dvc on behalf of the vice chancellor yes is to decorate the deputy vice chancellor on behalf of faculty of law thank you very much my dvc has taken a new uh, cap today <laughs> on behalf of the vice chancellor. Now, let me quickly recognize the Wara Community Senior Secondary School. We appreciate you. And I would like to invite Professor A.T. Shewu to give the photo of time. Yes, we are still expecting Professor Eti Shew for the vote of thanks.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم distinguished members of the high table especially our guest lecturer professor Njoku you are highly recognized and um, we have been putting heads together you see whenever we have an event of this nature the founder is always there to give support and to ensure that everybody smiles back home just about a week ago, the Faculty of Humanities had their own public lecture here too. But because they had a project on hand, the law students have met Baba. Baba has uh, done very big support for them. The Baba will not be tired of supporting the faculty even after he has supported the students. And he has asked me to make a donation of 500,000 Naira for the Faculty of Law, 500,000 Naira for the Faculty of Law. And he says we should pray that Allah will grant us many more opportunities to have uh, distinguished lecturers such as Professor Njoku from various disciplines to come and talk to us and uh, to add value to the university. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, all protocol duly observed. On behalf of the Faculty of Law, I want to thank uh, the representative of the founder of the Greece University, that distinguished scholar, uh, Professor Jamil Sulaiman Chimo. I also thank the chairman of this occasion, Yusuf Olaolu Ali, SAN, in absentia. But the greatest of all, thanks and appreciation, go to our very good friend, um, Chief. For those of you who don't know, um, Anthony Ojuku, SAN, is a high chief from Imo State. So, um, maybe because of the nature of the um, public lecture, he refused to appear in the regalia of high chief. I know him to be a high you know, the, here we have discussion concerning uh, the implementation of Child Rights Act in Nigeria. We discussed briefly to have us and later we invited the vice chancellor to join in the discussion and the discussion is uh, what actually led to what we are witnessing here today immediately we invited him though informally that time he readily accepted to be here and uh, the rest is history sincerely uh, we are grateful to to you not only for coming but for the brilliant presentation. I want to hope that when next we invite you to come to our university, you have no hesitation whatsoever to honor the invitation. And like my vice chancellor has uh, intimated you, and we also discussed about it yesterday, we are looking forward to a working relationship with uh, the National uh, Human Rights Commission we intend to have our own center for human rights uh, and uh, governance studies in some uh, time to come. So once again, I want to sincerely thank you
for being here with us. Uh, to the management, we sincerely thank you. We appreciate your moral and financial support. Without that financial and moral support, perhaps we wouldn't be, have been able to be here this afternoon. So once again, uh, the entire faculty is grateful to you. And um, to our um, the mamas, we sincerely appreciate your coming. The director center for this director center for peace and strategic studies. My very uh, uh, very uh, senior colleague, we thank you for being here uh, with us since morning. I saw when you come, we are sincerely grateful to you and to my dean, dean from uh, um, natural science, physical science, the dean of postgraduate school, who doubles as the dean of dean, and my very distinguished. Uh, 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 teacher, doyen of uh, Islamic law education in Africa, Professor Hezubaru, we are sincerely very grateful to you. And uh, my very good brother there, Leonard Silk, Abiodun Kaniki, the Dean of Law, Kwasu Kwara State University, we thank you for uh, coming. I will not be surprised that you are here with us today because the incubation of what translates to, to this lecture, I think you, you are there together with us. So we sincerely thank you for being here with us. And I look forward to when you will bring our friend Umar, Dr. Umar, to come here to come and give our second uh, uh, public lecture. Um, to our distinguished uh, colleagues and friends from the uh, Quara State uh, Human Rights uh, Center there, we thank you for your support. And um, you have been here with us. And even you got to the uh, executive secretary before my arrival. And together we come down. Since that time, uh, I can see you. And um, we are sincerely very grateful. To so, uh, staff of uh, faculty of law, I don't know how to present it. But God knows uh, how much you have supported the cause financially and morally. Uh, the, the dean has asked me to thank you immensely for everything you have done. That she is appreciative of you and she's proud of you. She says a lot of very kind words about you. And for that, we will continue to remember you. Thank you so much. And to our students, in all honesty, we are proud of you. We are proud of you. Um, you know, my dean reminded me that he was surprised that our students could ask very intelligent questions. I said, you don't know them. They are, they are very intelligent. Don't forget about the way we appear. We are very, very intelligent. So we are proud of you also. And um, we want to um, urge you that at whatever point, Wherever you may find yourself, you please continue to be good ambassadors, good image of uh, not only faculty of law Alikima University, but uh, Alikima University. Um, and to other members, the uh, do I say the press queue or the publicity people uh, from my very good friend there? I. I uh -huh. Dr. Wanuola and his team. We are sincerely very grateful. He used to be a member of my committee when I was the um, chairman ceremonial committee and he's been a very wonderful uh, colleague. So we sincerely appreciate you. Sikiru La, the uh, international photographer. <laughs> we all appreciate all of you. And um, um, I saw that the director of academic planning, please, convey our message to him. We are sincerely grateful to him. At whatever point in time we need his uh, assistance, he's been very, very supportive to the Faculty of Law. And finally, uh, we have to give thanks to Allah. We, we choose today, we are here today, and happily and joyfully at the same time. 
So subhanahu wa ta'ala Alhamdulillah 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 Rabbil Alamin Wa salatu wa salam ala ashratul muslimin Wa imamu muriselina Salu ala nabi al-karim Thank you Thank you Med Foster uh, Before calling our father to give us the closing prayer Let me just quickly announce this that After this uh, closing prayer We will gather right there at the university the university photo stand in front of the admin, admin block over there. So now I have the honor to invite our father, Professor Abdul Qadir Zubair, to please give us the closing prayer. Baba. ربنا لا تجعل بنا بعد زيادك أنا وعبدنا من لدك رحمة وحي لنا من أمنا رشدا ربنا أتنا في الدنيا سنة وفي الآخرة سنة وكنا عذاب النار الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا صراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين سبحان ربك رب العزيزين والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Thank you very much sir Shall we rise to have the Alikma Anthem Anthem. Thank you very much and see you again.
Mariana, oh me, oh, oh. I need my Mariana, oh me, oh, yeah. Mariana, oh me, oh, oh. I need my Mariana, oh me, oh, yeah.